1 Corinthians. Let's go there. Then we'll be turning to John 11 as well. First Corinthians 15, just and, and John 11. You know, I want you to think of this too. You know, all of heaven is rejoicing in a sense this day. This day is a triumphant, victorious, glorious day. Amen. And so all of heaven is, you know, uh, in a constant mode of uh, a pers just celeb a celebratory mode. Amen. And so you and I as believers, I mean, really today is about celebration. It's about celebration. And, but what I want to do is uh, relay that truth to you. Uh, that's something that you and I want to do on a daily basis, rather than just on Easter. Um, and so, but because all over, people are going to be really celebrating Jesus today and because it's Easter. But then as time dissipates, they kind of go back to their normal Christian routine, you know, and it shouldn't be that way. We should be conscious, cognitive of what Jesus has done, not just, you know, uh, for himself, but what he's done for you and I. And we should be uh, um what's the word I'm looking for in a, in a place of cooperating with that grace on a daily basis. Amen. On a daily basis. So uh, matter of fact, some of you went to the meeting last night and you heard about the power of God and, and the different things um, there from Nancy Dufresne. So, uh, you know, that might be new. Hopefully that wasn't new to you, but that's might be new to those people that heard it but I don't believe it's new to you, but you can still feed on that truth and be refreshed, okay? And so you and I, uh, she talked about cooperating in a sense with the power of God. I say it's cooperating really with the grace of God, being yielded. Uh, I forget she had some other terminology, but scripture says what we're gonna talk today is yield yourself. You gotta live the yielded life, man, amen? yielding yourself in and a lot of things i believe i can't remember them all that uh, were talked about a prayer life oh she talked about her prayer life that there were certain things going on and that it was spending uh time with god or uh, brother hagan you say uh, extended time with god praying in other tongues amen praying in the spirit and uh, that helps you to become inwardly conscious and aware Okay, and so we know that. And so, uh, but what I want to talk about this morning is um, 1 Corinthians 15. I don't have any notes. I have so many different little principles. Actually, if I can see my phone, I took, wrote some notes down this morning because I really felt like our job was accomplished uh, on Friday. So I want to try to keep it as short as possible and then we can just celebrate. And especially because people uh, don't show up. So, I don't want to say uh, it discourages me, but at the same time, you know, you prepare, you pray, you want people to be here. And of course you're here. And so that's important, but I want to see the other people here because I want them to grow. Right. I don't, I'm at a place now and just in general, uh, you know, I feel like at different times, you know, babying people, I feel like my ministry of babying people is over. I'm being honest with you. You know, you can edit all this later, but, I'm not down for babying people anymore, even my own children. I got no more time for it. The gift in me is too precious, too valuable to be spending on games and babying and all this other stuff. I've been there 20 some years and I've seen the people come and go. And I look back and, and of course, I don't have any ills in my heart, but I think about all these things. And, you know, I, I think about value and importance, you know, and actually this came up last night, but. And we were sharing along this line the last couple of weeks, which was something that I was reading in brother, brother Mark's book is, and I shared it here. And that's what's important about people being here on Tuesdays because Tuesdays is teaching. Amen. And you can't sit under the word here and not grow. 
The only way you can't grow in this church is you're either rebellious or you're sitting there and you're not listening. You're daydreaming on something else. I'm just being honest because there's too much time spent praying and preparing, you know? And the thing is, is what Jesus, I was sharing with the, these guys last night on the way home is what brother Hagen said was the world needs to receive Jesus, but the church needs to learn how to receive the Holy ghost. You have to meditate on these things, principles like that, because many times people are preaching Jesus to the church, but they don't need Jesus to be uh, taught to the church, so to speak. They need to be taught who they are in Christ. As you, as you have received Christ, you so walk in him, Colossians 2 tells you. Root it, ground it in faith, abounding there and in thanksgiving. You have to be taught faith, but then you have to bound in thanksgiving. You have to walk in the light of redemption. Amen. That means you have to learn to have an inward life that's greater and stronger than your outward impulses, the baitings, the seducing, the influence of the world, what your mind thinks, how you feel, and all these things. There'll be other churches that use our building after. And there's a lot of Christians that go to church, but they're still governed naturally. And the Lord wants to you to grow up out of that. Grow up into him, not grow up into your natural man. You need to grow up into the spirit. What does that mean? Looking, look, what does it mean growing up into the spirit? It means putting on the new man. Put on the new man. You can't be a baby your whole life. You can't have little carnal desires your whole life. Can't have the want to. I want, I want, I want. Me, 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 I. You know what I mean? There needs to be a crucified life. And therein is the reason why we don't see some of the power. I can tell you all day who you are in Christ. But then again, if those principles aren't lived, so you have to live like Jesus in order for that power really to be operative. You do. I can tell you about faith in that power, but the power will never, the, the power will never work if there's not genuine faith. Do you understand that? What is faith? If we were to ask this morning, what is faith? A lot of people just say, believe in your heart, speak with your mouth. That's faith. That's faith. No, that's how faith works. What faith is, is being fully persuaded. Fully, but, but persuaded about what? Persuaded about him. Persu not just that he wants to bless you. Persuaded about who he is overall. His holiness. His wisdom. His dominion. His rule. His authority. His power. It's not just being persuaded and con convinced about certain aspects. It's understanding the overall uh, dynamic and dimension of who God is. The great I am, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. So my, my message is when we understand the fullness of that, then the power really flows, right? And there's other areas too that uh, we have to understand um, you know, what he's done for us has to be lived out by faith, right? It has to be walked out by faith. But the thing is, is the power don't work just like the water doesn't flow if there's junk in the pipe. Now, here goes a good verse. Here's a good verse as well. And, and don't think you know what I'm saying when I say this. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. Without holiness. So if I say holiness right away, most believers' minds go to some aspect about, you know, uh, sexual content or something. But there's a lot of defiling that goes on through unforgiveness, through all kinds of other areas, hatred, uh, you know, uh, you know, discord, strife. These are these are things that destroy and hinder people. So there's a without holiness. You know, no man will see the Lord. I'm not talking about physically, but seeing him in the spirit, so to speak. Amen. Or seeing yourself in Christ as well. So um, there's a whole lifestyle that has to complement. Amen. And, and it's not that we don't know that, but lots of, uh, lots of God's children need to understand that. Right. Lots of God's children. And, and a lot of holiness also has to do with things like idolatry. You don't hear too much things like this, which is the deification of self and other created things. The deifying, inward motives, you know, agendas, we call them, 
right? There's a lot of things going on uh, in people's lives that need to be dealt with. They're, they're, uh, they're uh, dead branches. Amen? That the Lord wants to prune. But what's happened is people have gotten to such, uh, we've gotten into a place in the body where people just want to hear the things that are available and beneficial to them. You get my point? And there's nothing wrong with that. But really, you never apprehend benefits without real faith. Do you know that? You just don't. You never apprehend real godly benefits, right, without real faith. And real faith is made up of many components. And so we want people to have what Paul told Timothy, genuine faith, real faith. Amen? And so um, I think I was listening to... Uh, um, I think Nancy Dufresne's made a good point last night about biblical prosperity. Biblical prosperity. Because, see, you have to separate the difference and you have to know what is a bibl biblical prosperity and what is just somebody's talents, gifts, or marketing skills. Right? I'm serious. A lot of people don't know that. They look at somebody and because that person's a Christian, they go, oh, the Lord blessed them. I disagree with that because their lifestyle is contrary. So how are they being blessed? But they're living a life of lawlessness or sin, living contrary to God's way. So is God still blessing that? No, he's not. That's just their own aptitude. That, and someone go, well, it came from God. It may have came from God, but God's endorsement is not on it. Do you understand that? There's no endorsement. I don't care how much money they got. That's just like saying, you know, Bill Gates is endorsed by God or some other person that's not serving the Lord because they got a lot of money. You just validate them and say, well, the hand of the Lord is on there. You're a fool. You know, that's why it says the wealth of the wicked. <laughs> so the wicked must be able to obtain wealth in some means. Amen. So we have to define biblical things. Okay. And that's what we want. That's what I believe is important in this hour and in this generation is having uh, these components that Paul told Timothy, the end of the law or the goal is love, what? Out of a pure heart, faith, that's, let's look at it, genuine, and a what? I'm waiting on you guys. A pure conscience. Come on now. I mean, if you aspire to apprehend in First Timothy chapter one, I believe is verse six. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> now the goal, come on now, the goal of the law. What? Charity. First Timothy uh, uh, 1, 5, excuse me. Out of a what kind of heart? A dirty heart? A pure, clean, righteous, which the Lord has given us. Amen? He gave that to us, right? You can't make your, you can't make your heart pure in a sense. How many of you know that? Your heart is purified by his blood. Revelations 1, 5 says, unto him whoever loves us and washed us, cleansed us from our sins by his own blood. Amen. So the, the cleansing power and the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, right, purifies your heart so that your heart now is, or your spirit, man, is holy without blame before him. But you and I have to maintain a pure heart. So we have to exercise uh, or, or live in fellowship with the truth. And the truth will keep your heart clean. Amen. Now it says the goal, the end. Let me say the end. The goal of the commandment. It's not the Ten Commandments. Is love out of a pure heart. A good conscience. And faith unfeigned. From which some have swerved, turned aside unto vain janglings. Right? Just, uh, you know... Uh, intellectualism uh you know just self-knowledge earthly knowledge 
you know, uh, systematic theologies. You know what I mean? Just vain janglings. These are all kinds of things. I'm going to show you this. Is, these are all kind of things that are going on. All they are is just communications of things. Let me show, let me show you right here. And um, Paul, tells, Paul tells Timothy. Watch this. Let me see, show you right here. Uh, first, first Timothy 1, verse 4. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies that minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So you can see vain janglings, right? Genealogies, uh, these doctrines. Come on now, help me out. So we'll move along. Ephesians tells us that in the end times, right? There'll be all kinds of doctrines. People, doctrines is just teachings. That's all it is. It's just certain kind of teachings. So I'll read it to you. Certain kind of teachings. He tells us in Ephesians 4, he says, that you henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine or teaching by the slight and cunningness and craftiness where of men whereby they lie in wait to deceive that's in the book of ephesians right fables genealogies trickeries all these things they don't mean to be like that but they just are that's what the bible says all i'm doing is reading it about okay now but he says the end of the goal of the commandment so the highest order amen the highest law the highest order of the ten commandments the regulations, the law, uh, the new covenant, the highest order is love out of a pure heart. Amen. You go a long ways with that, don't you? Love out of a pure heart, faith unfeigned, and a good conscience. Faith, what does unfeigned mean? Genuine. Genuine faith. Amen. That means no matter what comes, you're holding fast to Jesus. You're steadfast. You're immovable. You're always abounding in the will of the Lord. Nothing's going to alter you. You're standing fast in the liberty whereby Christ has made you free. You're not dropping back to become entangled again with the yoke of bondage of this world. You're not pulling a Demas. Right? You know, Demas, Demas forsook uh, Paul having loved this present world. So what does that actually look like? Well, you know, we're going to talk about 1 Corinthians 15 in a minute, but loving this present world just means loving the earth. And a lot of Christians, I love my life. Where did Jesus ever say that? See, this is, I'm playing it cool. Where did Jesus ever say, love your life? never said that revelations told you they love not their lives even under the end jesus never said love your life yeah i know you're supposed to love yourself where does it say that never told you to love yourself but i understand you should have some value of your life and treat it right and take care of yourself that's in a sense love yourself but the lord never directly tells you to love yourself he says love the lord god and love your neighbor so you never really focus on loving your life <laughs> I love my life. Your life's supposed to, once your life, I'm just, I'm telling you what the Bible says. This is where the power's at of the resurrection. There's no, see, if you're not living that life, then the resurrection ain't working. You're living out of your own strength. See, because it takes the resurrection power to live the crucified life. You can't live the crucified life in your own strength. You can't give yourself to him. Because his requirements are, are obedience. But they're not obedience. They're obedience of the heart. Amen. They're obedience of the heart. Right? That's what the scripture said. Seeing you've obeyed from the heart through the spirit. You obey from the heart through your spirit. See, you can't obey God except by your spirit man your spirit man in conjunction cooperating laying hold and yield it by faith to the holy ghost who lives on the inside of you don't think it's all you come on he gave you the spirit of god the strengthener the help 
helper. Teacher, counselor, advocate, stand by. See, you yield on the inside to him and he helps and empowers you and energizes you to be able to step out of the spirit realm and act in the natural realm. Now, you don't necessarily go through that process of thinking, but that's what the Bible teaches. You've obeyed from the heart through the spirit an unfeigned love of the brethren. First Peter tells you, see that you love one another with a pure heart and do it fervently. Amen. That's living like Jesus, friend. Amen. You want to look at that real quick? Go on over there to First Peter. I'm going to show you. While you're on there, oh yeah, you're over in Timothy, so you can just shoot over into First Peter. First Peter, chapter one, verse twenty-two. Seeing you purify yourselves and obeying the Spirit under unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another, right? Isn't that what it says in the King James? The Amplified says, since your obedience to the truth, since your obedience, because you've obeyed the truth, you've become born again. You've yielded yourself to the truth. You've given yourself to Jesus. You become born again and regenerated. It's by the spirit, through the spirit, you have purified your heart now for the sincere affection of the brethren. See that you love one another fervently from a pure heart. See that now, if we talk about real love now, right? It's a whole nother realm. Love is taught very casually in the body of Christ these days. Look, you really want to see what love looks like? Look at Jesus. Are you ready to die? And of course, there's always some scholar that goes, I don't need to die because Jesus died for me. I want to live. Well, of course you want to live, you selfish little creature. <laughs> but the question is, is you'll never get away from the component of if it's true love, it must die. Because Jesus died, he showed you greater love hath none than this, than a man lays down his life. Okay, let's say it slowly. Greater love. Ready? Let's say, let's say it together. Help me out. You're going to help me this morning instead of me helping you. Greater love. Let's, say, let's think about that as we say it. Let it register on our spirit and on our minds. Greater love hath none than this, than a man lay down his life for his brethren there's no greater love than to lay down to invest to sow to give oneself holy i don't mean holy like pure i mean holy all the way greater love had none than this and so jesus demonstrated that love that's what easter is all about Easter is all about a demonstration of God's love. There is no greater demonstration than the crucifixion. And when we say the cross, really what we're encompassing is the death, burial, resurrection, and to some degree, the ascension and seating of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But greater love has none than this. Jesus showed you. Jesus didn't see. It's amazing how many people look at Jesus. They see all the blessings, the healings, the gifts and everything else, but they never see the true expression of love, which is Jesus gave himself for us time and time again. You can see it. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity. Titus three Galatians one says he gave himself to deliver us from this. Uh, uh, I forget the exact word they used. Uh, so I'm going to look it up real quick from this present evil age or order. The way out of the chaos, the degeneration, the moral corruption, the spiritual decay. Come on, all the baloney going on in the earth today is a joke. 
It's a joke. Racism is a joke. Now, if I even shared that, even in some churches, they think, brother, aren't you insensitive? No. Aren't you dull? You're dull. You say you should be more sensitive to certain ethnicities. Why? I would never be sensitive to whites. I'm not going to be sensitive to blacks. I'm not going to be sensitive to Asians. I'm not going to be sensitive to Hispanics. I'm not going to be sensitive to any race. Mm -mm. I'm not giving any race, you know, any sort of extra bonuses. Mm -mm. They're all the same. Racism is a byproduct of a fallen man. When you're regenerated and you have the love of God in you, you don't look at skin color no more. So you're not looking for your skin color benefits. Come on now. You're not looking for your skin color rights and your skin color health and welfare package. If you're a true Christian, you're not looking at, at somebody else, Jew even. You know, the only reason you look at the nation of Israel is because the Lord says, if you'll bless Israel, because they are the uh, olive branch in a sense. They're the root, you know, which we've been engrafted into. But the, and, and so we have to honor that. They were the first. But that's the only reason. Not because of the skin color. Just because they were given the holy oracles. Now, the reality tells, uh, you know, but they were cut off. Don't think that God doesn't play games. It's right there in the word. Go read it. Romans. He says, if you get haughty and act silly, basically, I'll cut you off too. You will be cut off. Just like they were cut off for their unbelief. They were only cut off, not because of sin. Romans 10 and 11 tell you they were cut off because of their unbelief. They going about trying to establish their own righteousness. That's crazy. They start it right. But along the way, they begin to default to the flesh. They begin. That's what Galatians tells them, tells us, doesn't it? Right. Galatians says, uh, oh, foolish Galatians. You ready? Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Amen. I sense the Holy Ghost is working here to teach. Listen, you not obey the truth. They obeyed the truth. They digressed. See, the truth that comes to you in revelation has to be held. That's what Jesus said. That, uh, that which a man hath, um, he, uh, he that hath shall more be added. More will be added to the truth that you value. You guard your heart. You treat it as precious. You treat it as valuable. More will be added. But if you don't treat it, even that which you have will be swiped from you. Not that God's taking it, although, you know, I know some people would disagree. They would disagree and get upset, even some people in my camp. But I'll tell you this, that Jesus came up to the guy with one talent, three talents, and five talents. And what did Jesus say? Take that from him and give it to him. Take it from him and give it to him. He didn't say add more to him because he's not using it. He said, you take it from him and give it to this person. Because they're producing. Interesting. Productivity. Right? So he said, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you've not obeyed the truth? Before your eyes, Jesus Christ has been crucified. That's what Paul wanted to know. He's like, you saw it. It was laid out before you. You saw Jesus on the cross. It was in your era, in your generation. And, and you never hear the Holy Ghost really asking you a lot of questions, but he did ask the Galatians. He said, Paul said, this only I want to learn of you. Really, I don't want your knowledge. I don't want what you're operating in right now. I don't want your doctrine. I don't want your thinking. I just want to know one thing. 
you begun in the spirit, why did you default back to the natural? He that worked and wrought miracles among you, did he do that out of your own strength? Did he do it out of your own energy? Did he do it out of your education, your bank account, your networkings, your job? Did he do it out of all that? Or did he do it by the hearing of faith or having believed what you heard? Come on, there's a lot of good starters. I could tell you this. As I, I've looked back over some of these Easter's and years, and I think there's a lot of people who start, but they're not good finishers. Do you know that? They started in Christ, and along the way, they got offended at Pastor Dave, or they got a, they didn't like something in the church or something, and they began to derail. They began to get off. Someone says, how do you know that? Well, it's even in 1 John. It says they weren't among us. They went out from us. We don't like to think of that, but they did. They went out because they were not of. It's what 1 John says. How many of you are familiar? Do I need to turn there? I don't want to turn there. They went out. See, it's not where it's not where you and I want to be. It's where God plants you. They that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish and bring forth fruit. It's not where you want to plant. It's where God plants you. I can tell you this. There's been a couple of people here that were trained up in, into ministry that should have been being used. That are doing their own thing now. and They'll be judged. I promise you. I didn't say they're going to hell. When, what I mean is judged. Everyone will be put in the balance in a sense. God will call you to accountability. What did you do? It's in 2 Corinthians 5. And he, and he says, give an account of your stewardship. How many remember the parable? Give me an account. Give me an account. No one wants to think of that. God's going to say, I need an account. Remember the king with the servant? I'm just telling them what Jesus said. I'm not, am I saying anything that's not in the gospel? I mean, we love the gospel except the parts where Jesus calls us to true faith. So Jesus says, I can turn there if you want. We're having fun now as a family this morning, right? This is what the resurrection produced for you. It didn't just enable you to go live a selfish life and hoard everything up for yourself. Now, I know nobody's attitude here is that. We're not talking about you. I'm serious. I'm not. I don't have any motives or agendas. I'm just exposing all of us so we stay on the straight and narrow. That we stay on the straight and narrow. That we stay with our minds renewed. That we stay walking in line with him and in union with his purpose and his calling. Amen. But you remember the story. The king said, give an account. And he said, uh, and he said, where's my stuff? And, and he said, well, and he said, take them and bind them or, or excuse me, not, not in that situation. He said, give me an account. And the steward went out and said, how much do you owe my master? And he goes, I own my hundred bushels. He says, what do you have now? Give it. He says, well, I got 50 quick, write it. Went to the next guy, collected that, went back. The king said he was wise. He didn't wait. You know, it's like some people, they're trying to sell something. They're, this is how I always attribute it. They're trying to sell like a car or a television or trying to just get rid of something, you know, liquidate it. And they, uh, you know, they put it on Craigslist or they put it up for sale. They post it somewhere or they tell people, well, I want, I want whatever for it. And they'll just hold out. And they won't compromise and lose, take a loss at like three, four, five, 10, 20, 30 bucks. They'll hold on to something. You know why? They think it's valuable, but it, it's diminished. And every year it's di diminishing more and more and more and more and more. Why? Because new technology comes on the scene. I see people trying to sell stuff and I think that thing is outsourced and outdated. You are going to get nothing for that. You might, might want to give that away. I mean, are you kidding me? That's like a piece of junk. You just can't tell them that because they'll get offended. Because they're not living in reality in the earth. How many understand? They think it has value and the value is dissipated, is went away, has lost its value, has been superseded, amen? Like the old covenant, superseded by the new. Glory to God. So those foolish Galatians fell back. Now, if you want to understand Galatia, 
it wasn't like a city of San Francisco. It's like California, Arizona, and Nevada. It is a region. So imagine the Lord addressing a region. It's not, he's not addressing a city. Do you understand? He's not saying, you know, if the miracles had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah at Ochozaran, that was a city. Come on now. He addressed the city. Oh, woe unto you, Chorazan. I'm probably not even pronouncing it right. Woe unto you, he said. Because if all the miracles that were done in you, really, if Sodom and Gomorrah, which were cities, had seen all these miracles, they would have repented a long time ago. Come on now, that's Jesus. Help me out this morning. That is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God that said that. So you and I have to take notice. Jesus said, if these things had been done in this city, in that city, they would have been on their knees saying, forgive us, Lord, wash us of this homosexuality, wash us of the murder, wash us of the filth, wash us of the grime a long time ago. Sodom and Gomorrah would have never been judged if they had those miracles. Read the scriptures. Jesus said that while he was on the earth. So there were some awful things going on in Cho Rosaran. Wasn't there? Where Jesus' eyes, when he looked upon them, thought, You were some, you were a dull city. You were dull. You're insensitive to God. I've done all these works and miracles, and you still don't believe. That's insanity. Right? Even when they came to persecute Jesus, he said, I was before you daily working miracles why are you persecuting me and want to murder me they couldn't find anything in he wanted to know all the miracles i've done all the healings all the wonderful things for which one of these works do you want to persecute and kill me that's what he asked them they and they couldn't answer it because the reason they wanted to persecute and kill him because they were infused and inspired by the devil they were mad with religion. Religion gets mad when the truth shows up. The heart becomes unsettled. See, when the ministry of the Holy Ghost begins to work, the heart begins to get plowed. See, the word hits the heart. When Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost, it says what? They were pricked to the heart. See, if the heart isn't ever challenged, then there's not no revelation flowing free. The heart has to be challenged. The heart has to be uh, convicted and challenged so that faith can arise. Amen. That's it. It's not just, uh, uh, it's even, even when you hear a message of something that is a blessing, it should challenge you to break the limits. We're going to read, which gives me a good point. But so I'm just sharing this is those Galatians, he said, uh, he said, having begun in the spirit, are you now reaching maturity by the flesh? So many begin growing, developing, and then they stop. They get just enough God to, to kind of want to take the reins back. That'd be the good word. They want to take the reins back again. How many understand what I'm saying? You know, or uh, <laughs> I like what, what Brother Mark says. He says, uh, um, when Jesus comes in, little I moved out and big Christ moved in. So what happens is they get just enough God that little I wants to move back on the throne. Get it? Little I wants to move back in. Little I wants to start making decisions and grabbing the reins again and living. But no, that's why the Lord gave us the Holy Ghost. Amen. To guide us in the truth. Why? He knew there'd be something out here that would try to derail you. Come on. He knew there was an enemy who, who walks about looking and seeking whom he may devour. How does he devour you? How did he devour Eve? Deception. 
deception. Come on now. Deception. That's how the enemy devours. He devours you to get to seduce you in to beginning to love, to value, to esteem something other that you weren't created to value, esteem, and honor. And it begins to pull you in to a cesspool of iniquity and death while you're on the earth. Amen. And you begin to drop back. Come on. You and I, I, I mean, here I'm, I'm now I'm happy this morning. Now I'm like, mm, 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 I'm, this is a good meal. Mm, 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 mm. I taste it literally. Mm. Because when I first showed up here, I was like, mm, I got a lot of things to share. But I want the Holy Ghost to work. I don't want a little three-point sermon. At, I'm bored with changing people's diapers. I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm not saying you guys. I'm saying in general, you know what I mean? People in and out. And it's like, man, grab a seat, stay for about 10, 20 years, and then you'll start growing. And then you can start walking in some power. Because then you can move out from your... You can have you can move out from the intellectual realm and move into the spirit where the Holy Ghost then can lead you and guide you. And you stop speaking things from here and you start speaking out of here. Amen. That's what the Lord wants to happen. It's called transformation. He wants to throw it and shift it in the overdrive now. Amen. Put you in the passing gear. Glory to God. Give you that turbo fuel you need. Extra octane. Help get you through life without struggling, right? Praise the Lord. Because there's someone out looking to destroy you. I, I, I'm sorry to tell you, there is. There's somebody that's looking to devour you. And even though many times we say, well, if someone's not doing the word, the devil's not really looking to destroy them. That's not true at all. There's some people that aren't acting on the word now, but the devil knows that at some point in some season, they're going to act on it. So if he can... Uh, if he can uproot that seed before it actually takes root and, and, and uh, circumvent the growth and development that he, that he knows is probably going to happen. How many of you know? Come on now. Let's just think of Jesus. I'll give you two characters. I won't start elaborating on it. The first, the highest is Jesus. King Herod said what? Come on, help me out, man, this morning. King Herod said what? Let's get rid of the the kids kill the babies he said i don't know who it is but those uh um shepherds uh, those wise men said the star of david there's a king and he said huh, what hmm, where he ain't got time to find out he just said slaughter all the firstborn get rid of them that spirit and guess who else it happened to during his generation i know i'm asking you i want to know your biblical knowledge Moses. Moses. Remember? Old Pharaoh said, get rid of all them babies, kill them. And actually repped what he sowed. One man. Now, people don't like that. They say, how could God kill the babies? He didn't. Pharaoh did. That shows you that, I'm going to add this. This is what the Holy Ghost is saying right now. That one man can ruin a nation. One person in a political office can ruin a nation. Now, don't interpret Trump or Biden or Reagan or Bush or whoever else you think, or Obama. But one person can destroy a nation like Pharaoh. Pharaoh destroyed a nation by, hard, by having his heart hardened and ultimately brought judgment on the nation of Egypt. It's never God's desire. God says, I desire mercy, mercy, not sacrifice, not a system of works. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God desires mercy. God desires mercy. He's not looking to judge anybody. He wasn't looking to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. How many of you know that? Uh, listen, let me blow up the religious thinking. Even though the Lord hates sin, understand that. 
Sin is detestable. It's wretched. It's putrid. God hates it. He doesn't look to destroy a place that is embalmed with inequity. His first commissioning is to extend mercy. If you don't believe me, go ask Jonah. Jonah got upset, didn't he? I know the spirit of God's here. Jonah got upset and said to the Lord, what? Jonah had a, Jonah had a, a pity party. See, Jonah was, was displeased with God's decision. He didn't want to go. You know why he didn't want to go? Because he knew what God would do. Selfish little Christian brother, wasn't he? Selfish little Jonah. See, he knew the love of God for himself. But then, see, that's the person that ain't a doer. He knew the love right there. That God's love for himself. But he would watch a whole city perish. Knowing that God's love could reach them. He did not want to go because he. Kaba, shiki, rama, iki. He had systemic racism. Yes, he did. So there you go. Jonah had racism. Someone says, I can't believe you'd say, it. go look at it. I want to go to Nimanith. I like those people. They were wretched. Read the history books. Basically, Persia or something. He didn't like that race. And Jonah was mad. I'm going to read it to you real quickly. I'm going to read it. Go over there to Jonah. I'll read it to you. I'm going to show you, man. Jonah was upset. Jonah 4. We're going to get back. And we're having Easter this morning because I'm going to tie this up in the resurrection. Jonah, chapter 4. I'm going to read you the Amplified. Verse 2, or actually look at verse 1. But it displeased Jonah. <laughs> it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Look at Jonah. I know you and I have been there too. Of course, a lot of Christians don't want to admit it. But look at Jonah. He's upset. He's mad. He's angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, ain't this what I said to you when I was in my own country? <laughs> Ain't this what I said? Didn't I tell you this, Lord? Those worthless people over there, they deserve to be judged. They're a bunch of sinners and heathen and wretched and miserable people. They deserve to be punished. This is what his attitude was. Look at his little attitude. That's why I fled to Tarshish. For I knew... That you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. When sinners turn to you and meet your conditions, you revoke the sentence of evil against them. Hmm. You revoke the sentence. That's, that's the love of God. Amen. So Jonah told God. When I was in my country and you wanted me to go to them heathen, Jonah had that old systemic racism going on because of his religiosity. Amen. It's right there. If you can't see it, I don't know. You need your eyes open. Maybe you're watching. Jonah said, I'm not going. I knew. See, Jonah's up there fellowship with the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's, <laughs> we worship you. And then the Lord said, yeah, go over to that country and bring that worship and bring that fragrance and bring this life that you got dancing around in the church and get over to that nation over there because they are in a place where they're about to be judged. I've released the sentence, but I put it on hold for now because I believe that, Jonah, when you go over there and bring this fragrance, when you go over there and release what you got, we worship you. When you bring that over there, Jonah, I know they're going to change. 
But Jonah wasn't, didn't want to bring his, we worship you. Jonah wanted to bring something else. He was like, nope, I ain't going. But he didn't want to even tell the Lord that. So he just went and ducked tail and jumped on a ship and said, I'm going the other way. He went to Tarshish. That means going the other way. That's what it means. I'm going the other way. I, I don't want to bring this to them. They don't deserve it. They're wicked. They don't know you, Lord. You know? And then all that happened. And then the whale, the Lord sent that whale and gave us a type and shadow of hell. Like Jonah was in the heart of the whale. Three days and three nights, so the man will, so the son of man will be in the heart of the earth. Because it must have been hell being in that whale. Gas, seaweed, everything else he ate, splashing around, stinks, can't sleep, it's wet, noise. I mean, you don't know what's going on inside the, a whale. I mean, dark. Ain't no light in there except when he opens up to eat something. Claustrophobic. I mean, going down deep, deep, deep. Your ears popping. Pass out because it's like you don't you have a proper oxygen level. <laughs> you get right all that going on. In the belly of the whale. So those old Galatians, let's look. Those old Galatians, look, look what let me I want to get to the amplifier. Then I, then I gotta get back to first Corinthians 15. And then we're gonna talk about that oil of gladness. I mean, Galatians 3, he says, Are you so senseless and silly? Haven't begun your spiritual life. Are you now trying to reach maturity, growth, development? Uh, are you trying now to be a good coach and an upstanding citizen? Are you trying now to be a good moral person in society by your dependence on your own abilities, your own intellect, your own knowledge? Are, are, are you trying to produce these things now? I mean, think about that now. Look. You know what's interesting? I've seen a couple different churches. They were smaller. And they were, you know, as soon as they got like a big screen and a better building and a worship team and everything else, they kind of become like a professional organization now. They start, yeah, they start becoming professional. And that's what happens. That's what Jesus said in Revelation 3, didn't he? He said, you say you're rich and you have need of nothing now. The church, right, of Laodicea. You say, I don't need nothing now. I'm all good. I'm taken care of. We're good. We began with you, but we, we we're good now. We got this system working, you know. And Jesus then, and, and, and he says, you know, I counsel you to buy of me gold. He said, you're blind, wretched, naked, miserable. And they're thinking, man, we're on the cutting edge right here. Everything's hunky-dory and fine and dandy. And we're, we're walking in the light and we're reigning on the earth because we're so prosperous. We're, we're My point is this. Jesus was the one that caused them to prosper. But they allowed that prosperity to maneuver them away from the reality, right? Of who he is. And they ever so slightly became blind. They became blind. They can't see anymore. They're in a system. Right? But there's no freshness. The things that were there. Like, like their first love stopped. Their first love. Their love for Jesus stopped. And they started loving other things. Amen? And the Lord always calls us back to the, the first love, back to the foundations. Amen? Back to the first thing. So he tells them, 
He says, now look, he says, verse four, he reminds them, you've suffered so many things. You've experienced, is this all for nothing? He who supplies the spirit to you and works powerfully and miraculously among you, did he do it on the grounds of the law or did he do it by what you believe? Did you do it? Did he do it by what you believe? So if you want the work of the Holy Ghost to be on demand, operating, functioning, you're going to have to continue to feed your faith. You're going to have to continue to stay in a place of believing. Amen? Stay in a place of yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. Stay in a place of not only that, obedience of faith romans 1 says obeying from the heart listening in the spirit hearing on the inside and then following hearing right recognizing receiving what he has to say and then acting on what he has to say right Recognize, receive, and respond. Or recognize, reverence. Back to reverence, receive, and then act on it and respond to it. Amen? Reverence. Reverence what God is doing. This takes you to that next level, doesn't it? Honor. Honor the things of the Lord. So they don't become drossed. They don't become cluttery. Continue to value those. Amen. Honor. So now go to 1 Corinthians 15. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15. We'll read. First Corinthians 15, I'm going to read verse 1. It says, let me remind you, since it seems to have escaped you. See, did you hear that? Of the gospel of salvation. Now listen, Hebrews 2 tells us, give the more earnest heed, lest these things begin to dissipate and slip. Galatians 5 tells you, stand fast in liberty. And be not entangled again with a yoke of bondage. So what he's saying is, be cautious, be aware, be sober, uh, uh, be dialed in. Constant and continuous. Because if not, things might escape you. They might slip away. And then you find yourself in a place, you're still a believer. But you're not in a place of obedience, yieldedness, and pleasing the Lord. You're not fervent in spirit serving the Lord. Didn't say you weren't serving, just says you ain't fervent. You can serve the Lord in a slothful way. You can serve the way in a, in a, in a fake way, in a play-acting way. Amen? You're the only one that can condition yourself, you and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You and the Holy Spirit. So he says, I, I, I want to remind you of these things of the gospel, which I proclaim to you, which you welcome and accept it upon which your faith rests and which you are saved by. If you will hold firmly to what I told you, unless you believed at first without an effect and for nothing. So first of all, I want you to understand, he says that Christ died for your sins. You could say that today, and a lot of people just doesn't really move them. <laughs> They're just like, Jesus died for my sins. Okay. Jesus died for my sins. Great. And what do I get? I'll tell you what you get. You get a clean heart. You get a pure conscience. You get to live with an understanding and an awareness like the Apostle Paul said. My conscience is clean. 
though he committed and validated murder, his conscience was clean. You may not have everything outwardly, but you can have a pure conscience before God. Amen. You can have a pure conscience, no matter what you did before Christ or you done in Christ, large, small, medium, the resurrection affords you the privilege of having a clean, clear conscience daily. Glory to God. Neither by the blood of bulls and goats, but his own blood entered once in a holy place, having obtained an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes, ashes of the heifer, sanctify the outward man. How much more shall the blood of Christ through the Holy Ghost, through the eternal spirit, purge, purify, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. See, you can't serve him carrying all the debris of the past or the present failures you have. You've got to allow the appropriation of the blood of Jesus to purge and have a continual cleansing effect on you so that you can be liberated and be lifted out of what I shared on Friday, lifted out while you're living in the body still from amongst the dead things in the realm of the earth. Because the earth is in a corrupt mode still. The earth is crying and waiting for the sons of God, the sons of liberty to appear. The earth is in a groaning place because it's been subject to corruption by Adam. Had a striking event when Adam yielded to sin. Sin came in and defiled. It set hurricanes in motion it brought earthquakes it didn't even just affect humanity and create racism and covids and and economic collapses and and pride and jealousy and murders and and debaucheries and and uh, uh degeneration and and all these things it affected the earth itself destabilized the earth the power of sin That's why you and I got to see the effects of sin and not ever play around with it. I'm not talking about just outward sin. I'm just talking about any sin because whatever's not of faith is a sin. Where there's no trust in him and dependence, it's a sin. That's what the scripture teaches us. What is sin? That's why Jesus said he tried to communicate to them, you know, uh, he, if a man looks on a woman inappropriately, he could commit adultery in his heart. If your hand offends you, chop it off. So what Jesus was doing, he was bringing a whole new revolution, making man to become aware of the inward things that are going on. Come on now. The resurrection affords you to have a clean cup now. Let's look at what Jesus said right here. So when you think about the power of sin, the power of the blood of Jesus to annihilate and to and a wipe away and put out an operation. I want to look at this in Luke. Let me see if I can get to Luke real quick. What Jesus said about. Oh, help me, Lord, right here. Hold on. I got to see if I can find it. Here it is. Uh, Luke 11. I thought it was a map, isn't it? No, no, no. Better. Here's a better place. Here's a, be here's a better place. Let's see. Yep, this is better. Go to Mark 7. Come on now, what Jesus, what Jesus was wanting to accomplish was not just to get you outwardly in a position. What he wanted to do was bring a whole demographic shift on the inside of humanity. 
Come on. He didn't need to wipe away Sodom and Gomorrah anyway. What he needed to do, he needed to wipe away a sin nature. Come on. A nature that kept humanity separated from the Father, kept man in chaos, in a degenerated, depraved mode. Jesus didn't come just so you can get a Cadillac. He came for a full altering. Come on, a, a regeneration of humanity to create a new species of being. He came back. Amen. And a lot of people don't understand that. Look at Mark 7. This is what Jesus began to deal with. He says, Mark 7. I'm going to read you this. And, he, and verse 14. And when he called all the people unto him, he said, listen. Every one of you understand there's nothing from outside of a man that entering in will defile him. But the things that come out, say the things that come out, those are the things that defile. If any man has an ear, let him hear. See, these people were bought into a religious system. They had defaulted back to thinking it's not that the law was bad. The, the, the law is not bad, but that sin in us was bad so it's what it says in romans so what he said he was trying to get them to stop trying to look at ex external outward things that were going on because when they look at things outwardly every man's looking at his neighbor nobody's looking at what's going on in their internal walk and he says right here he says if you have an ear then go ahead and hear this and when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples said, his disciples even had to have a question. Come on now, because they didn't even understand it. I mean, we'll hurry up. Look, when you understand what you were previous to becoming a new creation in Christ, Easter gets a whole lot more celebratory. Look at Jesus just said, look, fellas, nothing entering in you can defile you. But what's in you that comes out is what defiles. And they didn't go, glory, got that, Jesus. You know what they said? Hey, Peter, what's he talking about? I don't know. What, what, what's he talking about, John? I don't know. That's some deep stuff. You know why? You know what? No, I'm not kidding. I'm not making light of it. You know why? Because their whole life they were raised. Touch not taste not racism those are gentiles they were taught the dietary regulations and ordinances externally go look at the book of leviticus they were taught purity outwardly they were taught righteousness as a means of how you behave can't you see that so when these people were conditioned, man. So when Jesus said, look, man, that piece of lobster that brother just ate, that ain't going to defile him. That bacon, that's not going to defile him. But I'll tell you what will defile him. Now, look, look what Jesus said. And he was entered into the house of those people. And he says, right, we could be here all day now because the Holy Ghost, Jesus looks at him and goes like this. Just listen, you, you have to catch the heart of Jesus. Otherwise, you'll only see Jesus in one aspect. And the only Jesus you'll see is what Jesus does for you all the time. And you'll be always asking Jesus for something or believing him for a car, a better job, more money in your bank. You'll, you'll, you'll never really capture the reality of what your redemption has afforded you. So Jesus, this is amazing because Jesus asked Pat right here, he goes, he goes, Look at, just look at Jesus. Jesus, pretend I'm Jesus. You know, brother, are you without understanding? I mean, Jesus was in a sense marveling. Like, do you not understand this? Like, that's what he's basically asking him. He says, are you without understanding also? <laughs> he, was, he was shocked. Do you not see? Can, can you not see this? It'd be like me up this pulpit going, can't you see what I'm saying? And you just sit there and go, 
I guess. I'm, I've sat in church for five years. I still don't get it. I, I, I heard the reality of my redemption, but then I draw back to who I was before I became a Christian. So you never heard it. You hear me? No, you nope. It wasn't real to you. It wasn't real to you. See, if you default back, if you default back, or they used to call it backsliding. See, if you default back, it was not real to you. It wasn't real to you. I'm not saying you don't have a bump in the road or a challenge, but, but if you default back to who you were, you take the blood of the lamb and place it underfoot. That's what Hebrews tells you. You crucify the Lord all over again. I can't go back into the world, friend. Do you understand that? I can't go back to drugs, crime, alcohol, dishonesty, hatred, vengeance, unforgiveness. No, that ain't never going to happen. I could never do that. Possible. Thank you, sister. Because the life of God is in there. I couldn't hit a bar for a week straight, but at some point, I'm crawling up out of the pig pen. Get it? Because there's a there's a nature in there that says, casa. Oh, no, this ain't you. This stinks here, Jonah. This is dirty here. This is this is there's something missing. You're not being fruitful. It doesn't feel good in here. I'm not used to wearing rags. Uh, I'm not used to, to struggling and being depressed and oppressed and bound by sin. I, I, I remember when I was free and happy and blessed and joyful. I, I remember when I had vision and hope, see, because of that inner life. And first John even tells you that. That no man born again because the nature in him practices sin practices you know what i mean by practice lifestyle i didn't say you won't sin here and there i'm not that's not what it says it says no man can practice living a life contrary to love and light and truth no man that's why the scripture says in first john I'm, I'm gonna read it in a sec so this is the resurrection friend this is the reality of what the resurrection gave you it gave you the right now to say, I choose not to sway. I choose not to go with the, the populist opinion of the world. I've come out from among them. I, I, I don't need the Budweiser, the king of beers. I, I need the Koshede, the king of kings. Uh, no, no, no. I have a physician named Dr. Jesus. Come on now. Uh, I, I've got a Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Yiri. I've got El Shaddai. I got the one more than enough. Oh, I may not have what I want in my pocket right now, but Jehovah Jireh, Jireh, the one who sees down the road, the one who sees ahead. Come on, as I keep walking, I'm going to walk into that fullness of provision. That's what it means, Jireh, the, the one who sees ahead. Isaac, I notice we got the wood. Oh, I should start preaching here. I, I know because I sent. Remember how I told you yesterday? Remember? I take a side note. Pat, he likes to rhyme, and he's sitting there, and then he just blows up and starts doing his thing. Right? No, I'm serious. And I'm like, brother, we got to get that on CD and sell a million. Like, you know, he starts. He starts just, and, but it explodes and he just says, bro, I just capture it. And, just, and I go, I understand because that's how I feel when I'm preaching. I see something and then it just blows out of me and people go, I don't like that. That's loud. It's not that it's loud. Don't you understand what it's like when a rocket takes off? Do you understand when a bomb detonates? See, if you don't see, you have no clue of the resurrection. Then you're looking for a Jesus that just uh, the, a Jesus that just woke up and went, I have arisen from the dead. You have no revelation because when the Holy Ghost himself descended into the earth, 
Do you understand? It said he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. You understand the Holy Ghost surged in to hell itself while Jesus was dead and strapped and the quickening, regenerating power of the Most High went into Jesus and Jesus arose up mightily, shook him off in the power of God. And when you put your faith in him, that same power surges into you. You rise up above the earth sin and all the catastrophes of man you think that brother's spitting what if there's a COVID there ain't no COVID on that you knucklehead there's holy anointed life in that spit you just hadn't been awakened yet you're still bound by the earth and Dr. Fauci they get over with RX Jesus he been lifted up on the cross. And when you look at him, the power of sin is neutralized. You can reign. If you're sitting in the church, I'm raised up in heavenly places with Jesus. But you ain't reigning. You're in dormant. Little Isaac. I'm just saying. Okay, run over that way. Little Isaac carrying up the wood. Dad? Dad? We got the wood. I know God's commissioned you. I know the Lord's commissioned you. Go up to Mariah right now. Got the wood. I know you heard God because I've seen the blessings. I've seen and saw and experienced the presence my whole life watching you. But what I want to know, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham never flinched and said, God himself will provide. I ain't just yelling because... I don't like that. Born, my friend, out of experience of faith. Born in a Bible school, sweetheart. Born having to believe God that he's your provider. God will provide. He never flinched. Knowing, knowing that God said, Take your son and offer him to me. Abraham never moved, but was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he would perform. Here we go, Isaac. Up the mountain we go. We got our marching orders. The devil on the way up that mountain was chatting in his ear saying, what's going to happen? You're going to kill your son. Why would God ever ask you to give that offering? Why would the Lord ever ask you to give Isaac? You know, you spent all those years. He's just a taker. See, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. See that foolishness? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. You know, remember Job? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. The devil was setting that in Abraham's ear, probably. That's not something that just came on the scene with Job. That's been around a long time. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Look at him. He gave you this son, and now he wants him back. You must have been a sinner, Abraham. You must have did something wrong. The devil was chiming his whole way. But Abraham was fully persuaded. God will provide himself. God is faithful. I got a promise. He said, in me, all nations will be blessed. I know that Jesus is coming in the earth and the world is going to be transformed. A new order is going to be put in operation. That's what Abraham saw. If you don't believe that, Jesus said it. He said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. He saw my day. Abraham saw Jesus on the cross, rising from the dead, 
the life and blessing of God going out to every human being that whosoever would will. The gospel. And Paul says, right here, look what Jesus said. We'll get back to Paul. He said, don't you understand and perceive that, whoso, that whosoever, what, whatsoever thing from without enters into man can't defile him because it doesn't enter into his heart. Enter into his spirit. But into the belly and then goes out. <clears throat> And he, and he said, that which comes out of a man is what defiles. From within, out of the heart, see that out of the core being, out of the spirit, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All this evil comes from within that defiles a man. <laughs> Just like I said the other night. And you know, I was a little freaked out for a minute. I was watching Pastor Eric put up a video and I went like this. At the end of the message, I was like, and that. Like this, and I was pointing at the Bible and I went, ooh, what's that look like to you right away? What's that look like? What does that look like? Come on. Right away. I don't know anything about hand signs. Yes. Yeah. Have you ever seen those videos and they got some people videoing some preachers? They're like, look at his hand. And he's like, like it's some preacher and they're showing the preacher going like that. And they're like, see, he's really not a Christian or something, you know, some creation. So there I was going, because the word said. I was under the power, just like just now when I was preaching. It's not from the head. And I was like, ooh. And, and, and I was like, look at those hands. I wonder if I was like, you know, under the wrong spirit or something. You know, because you could yield to the wrong spirit. Now, I endeavor not to. Even Brother Hagin said certain people at certain times in their life will be challenged to, to yield to the wrong spirit. Just look at Balaam. Look at Peter. So I was looking and I went, ooh, that's weird. So I, I Googled it. And you know what it means? The universal sign language of love. Hallelujah. You don't get it. Because when the Holy Ghost is working in you, come on, he knows the right signs. He's in control. Sometimes you do stuff you don't even know. You're just like, hallelujah. Holy Ghost. Give me that love. Bam. You know what this sign is? There's all kinds of hand signs. So when I was preaching, I was like, and the word. hand in and go like that that's the devil but this is the universal sign of love <laughs> and i was like oh man and then i looked i was like it just reaffirmed when you're under the influence of god he takes control of all of course you have to yield but he's influencing your thoughts your tongue your gestures hmm? we'll hurry up all these things come from within. So back to what the apostle Paul said, I want to first remind you what I passed on to you, that Jesus died for your sins. Jesus died. All that defiled from within. Jesus brought a whole new order into operation. Man became a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5. Where am I at? Oh, man, this isn't my. Anyway, it says 2 Corinthians 5 in 21. He made him to be sin who knew no sin. 
Jesus took all these things upon himself. I'll tell you this, those things are not operating on the inside of me today. Now, I can't speak for you. You have, to, you have to affirm those of your own life. But I can tell you this. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. That the old things have passed away. Jesus afforded me a life now that I never have to experience these things. Amen. I never have to experience pride. I can just stay humble. The Bible says, humble yourself. Stay humble. Stay yielded. Stay small. Stay given to him. I don't have to operate in foolishness. I don't have to have evil flow out of my lips. In our behalf, God identified Jesus with everything in the whole realm of sin in order that by trusting him, you would now become a recipient of the God kind of righteousness. That old things would leave. He says, I'm reminding you of this. He was buried. He arose the third day, as the scripture said. Now, a couple more verses. Go on over to verse 19 then. Or, or verse 19. And it says, if we who are abiding in Christ hope only in this life, that is all, then we're a people most miserable and pitied. Do you know what that means? What that means is this. If you think the sum calculation in total of your existence is on this earth, you are a pitiful person. Now, I know somebody don't like that. There's probably some great theologian. Some of my season. I don't like that preacher. I don't, I don't care what you like. I, I care what St. Paul said. He knows more than anybody besides Jesus. How could the Holy Ghost enhance that to say, if there is no resurrection, if only in this life you get a great car, you get a great family, you get some great sporting events, you get a great vacation, you get to look good. If only in this life you get to enjoy and who gains the most toys wins. If only in this life you're just happy every day and joyous, wonderful, and everything's great. Paul says, let me summarize that up for you. All that still equals pitiful. All that equals pitiful still. Because Ephesians trumps that goes beyond and says that in the ages to come, that in the ages to come, he's going to show you. Come on. He's going to show you the greatness, his mercy, how wonderful it is to be in him. The exceeding greatness of his kindness towards you. Ages to come, you're going to be like those in eternity. You're going to be like those that went, the lamb slain. And you see him come out and his robe is dipped in blood. And you go, holy, 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 worthy of honor, praise and glory. Because you spent a short time, maybe 100 years on this earth. But all of a sudden now you're in eternity and you look back and you go, whew. I couldn't have missed this. I don't know what I, I could have missed. You can't even fathom that until you're there. Right now, we know in part. As much as we study and pray and ask the Holy Ghost to enlighten us, we still know in part. We, we haven't seen the fullness of it. He desires to show us, so that's why we got to keep asking and seeking and praying. But when you get to eternity and you step over, and you're with the Father, you're going to look back and go, oh, thank you for the blood. Thank you. And you, you'll be really great. You'll, and you'll be like, where's Johnny? Where's Johnny, man? We went to Catholic school together. And you'll see Johnny's cousin. And Johnny's cousin goes, Johnny ain't here. Yeah, but, but he went to school. I saw him at the church. He made a few signs. Yeah, but, but all I know is 
I was watching TV one day and there was a minister on. And I said, Johnny, man, what he's saying is true. And Johnny went like this. That dude's a clown and walked out of the room. But, but I, I heard those words for some reason and hit my knees right there in my front room. And I asked Jesus in my heart. Johnny just walked out and dismissed it. And Johnny's not here. That's going to be the reality for all of us someday. Don't you be deceived. Don't you think everybody that leaves this earth will be in eternity with you? As a matter of fact, I'm telling you, there's a lot that aren't. And I, I don't have a problem saying it. Some of them will be family members. And they might even be your own children. And I can say that. You know why? Because I have children. I have children. But I can't give an account to Jesus for Josh or Caleb. And I've already rolled that around in my mind. You know what I mean? And in my heart, I can't give an account. All I can do is share the truth with them. Someone says, how do you know you're saved? Because I know this. Outside of Jesus, I am a sinner and hell bound. But because of the cross, because of the resurrection, he was delivered for our offenses, Romans 4, 25, raised again so you and I would be justified. That our father looks at us today and he says, there's my son, David. Holy without blame before me. And someone goes, yeah, but I know that guy. He stole a car. He had a divorce. He raised his voice. I heard him cuss one time. No, Satan. Let me show you his confession when he was by himself. Let me show you every morning how he broke open the communion and said, Lord, the blood of Jesus is my divine protection and covering. There's not one thing in me the blood doesn't cleanse. Lord, forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Purify me. Thank you, Father, for making me the righteousness of God. In and of myself, I'm nothing. But I come to you, Jesus, as my Lord, my Savior. And then the Lord pulls up that video and shows him. That's what I've been afforded. And so have you. And every day, don't take your life for granted. Thank God for Sister Bernie sitting here. Talked to her yesterday. But I'm just going to break this down. Bernie fought off an ammonia. But I'm sure the devil was coming in her mind telling her she had COVID, right? Probably. And guess what? The devil gets up in there and says, you got COVID. You're going to die. Well, I'll tell you this. The cross and the... The resurrection have prevailed and afforded you an opportunity to have access to the Father. By one spirit, we have access to the Father. We just go right to him. Doesn't mean there's not challenges. Doesn't mean there's not problems. But man, we, we have a way out. If we will hold fast. Amen. To the traditions of Christ. If we will hold fast. Let me read you a couple of the verses and we'll close. First Corinthians 15, verse 57. Actually, verse, I'm going to read, I'm going to read uh, verse 55. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? Now, sin is the sting of death and sin exercises its power upon the soul. Through the abuse of the law. Thanks be to God who gives you the victory. Making you conquerors. Through Jesus Christ. Today I was on a, a field. I was over at West Sunset praying. And I was behind on the soccer field. Was there where me and Pat were yesterday. And I thought, I thought about this. See the resurrection is about a battle. It'd be like all those sporting events. That happened there. Over the years past. And. That'll happen now and, and in the future that'll go on. It'll be like those championship games where there's a battle. And then Tom Terrific, 
You guys know who Tom Terrific is? Tom Brady. Tom Terrific battles and wins the Super Bowl and marches right over. Come over here, bro. Just stand right there. And marches over and goes, the trophy's yours. That's what Jesus did. You ain't seeing that. Jesus fought the battle. Jesus did everything that was necessary and then handed to you the victory. That's why I said, thanks be unto God. Come on. Who always causes you to trap. Why? Because he already killed death for your grave. Where's your victory? Jesus said, I am he that was dead and alive forevermore. I am he that have the keys of Hades. They've been handed to you now. The gates of hell will not prevail against you. You're more than a conqueror. If God be for you, who can be against you? That's what the resurrection has provided for you. It has provided a means when you leave this church building today that you will be led by his spirit, governed, influenced by his love. It will control, dominate to the degree that you yield to it, that you allow it. Just like Peter said, such as I have, give I thee. Gold and silver have I none, but such as I have. He didn't say, not that Peter was broke, but what he said, what's more important is what's on the inside of me. This is what I want to offer you. My coins and my money may not change your life and alter it forever, but what I have on the inside will launch you out into the eternities of eternities. And when you transition up out of this earth, you will stand with the lover of your soul, your heavenly father, your Abba. And you will see him then face to face and know him as he's known you while you were even tabernacled in this body. Amen. That resurrection life raised you up, lifts you out. Philippians says it lifts you out from among the dead. We look at one last verse and we close. Go to Luke, Luke 11. Excuse me, John 11. See, when Jesus came to earth, he wasn't just, I, I'm, I'm telling you, Jesus wasn't coming just so you can get a new car. Jesus wasn't coming just to renovate your inner man and make you a better person. That's not why Jesus came, to make you better. So you be better. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to purchase and redeem you from all inequity and then to purify you make you a people that would be zealous, pursuant of him, and that that life and relationship you had with him would then be manifest into all the world. Jesus said, by this, all men will know you're my disciples. Amen? That by love. We need to redefine the definition of love, don't we? Don't we? Because true love, take, it takes some yieldedness. Because the world ain't perfect. You and I are perfect in Christ, but we're not always perfect. So it takes the love of God. See, and the love of God never fails. So you can just see that people quit and give up and many times leave churches. You can see right there that they failed. You know, but they don't rec ever reconcile that. You know what I mean? I could say I failed before. That was why I always endured to try to make marriage work. Because if you're truly walking in love, then you can't fail. Do you know that? If you're truly walking in love, you'll never fail. Ultimately, that's what it gets down to. Your head will come up with all kinds of reasonings. They did this and they did that. And, but, but the reality is, is it has nothing to do with them. They can be the nastiest person who spits at you, pulls your beard like Jesus, slaps you, buffets you, says prophesy to me, pierces you with a sword. Come on, gives you vinegar to drink. But your love should never fail. Now, many times our love fails, doesn't it? My love has failed and your love has failed at times. That's why you can go back to the blood. Amen. You have an everlasting covenant. It never, it never, it never dies. The blood has freed you for all eternity. You can keep going to it. You can keep going to Jesus, come unto me. And guess what? You will improve if you keep coming. If you keep drinking. If you keep laying aside. 
if you keep putting off the old and putting on the new. If you're determined, just, just keep going unto him. Come unto him. Keep coming. Keep coming. That's what Joel said. Keep coming unto me till every hindrance is removed. Keep coming and getting more of him. And as you do, eventually, you will conform. You will grow up in him. You will begin to walk as he is. So are you in the world. You won't have to tell people you're a Christian, so to speak. You don't have to. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I tend not to say that to people. I'd rather say I'm a believer. I believe in Christ Jesus, my Savior. Your testimony is good enough to go a long way. John, here we go. John 11, we're closing. John 11. I can't read it all. We start in verse one. And a certain man was sick named Lazarus from Bethany of the town of Mary and Martha. And it was that Mary which anointed Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother was Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sisters went to him and Jesus heard it. And he said, this sickness will not be unto death. <clears throat> For the glory of the Lord and the son of God might be glorified. And Jesus and Martha, the sisters, and he went and, and it says that as he went, he said to the disciples, let's go. Lazarus is sleeping now. And they went, oh, let him sleep. And Jesus went, Lazarus dead. That's what he said. Verse 14, Lazarus dead. <laughs> Look at Jesus. I love Jesus. He's so simple and to the point. They're like, oh, let him sleep, Jesus. He probably needs rest. He'll, he'll do good getting some sleep and resting and refreshing himself, right? And Jesus go. Lazarus dead. <laughs> Lazarus dead. That's a rap song right there. You're feeling it, huh? Coming out of the tomb with something, you know what I mean? So, Lazarus dead, now alive. Here he goes. And Jesus said, look at Jesus. Jesus had a little attitude. He said, and I'm glad for your sake <laughs> that I wasn't there. Look at Jesus. Lazarus dead, but really, I'm glad for you that I wasn't there. <laughs> I mean, how does that feel to some people? If I just went, look, man, uh, Lazarus died, but but Patrick, I'm glad for you. You're thinking, me? What you making it about me for, man? Because you don't really believe, but now you're going to believe. You're thinking, yeah, I do. I believe. I go to church. I watch preachers on TV. I believe. Uh-huh. And he says, and to the intent that you may believe, nevertheless, let us go. I mean, that's some that's some pretty challenging stuff. You got your posse with you. I'm, I'm getting done. You got your entourage who've been with you, who've seen the miracles, who ate the fish and the loaves. And now Jesus just says, I'm glad for you that I wasn't there. You're thinking, why me? Because you don't believe. What, what do you mean we don't believe? We've been with you three. You don't know why they were with Jesus, do you? Many people think these apostles were just the greatest people that ever walked the earth. They, some of them were killers. You better do your research. You guys don't even know about Simon the Zealot. He was a nationalist. You thought these, these, these people that were with Trump breaking capitals were something? Nothing. You think I'm kidding? Do your research. Most people, they're ignorant. That's what a zealot was. Simon the Zealot. John and James, their names were son of bone angerous, bone anger, sons of thunder. They had quick tempers. They were fishermen. It wasn't like they were like, hi, how are you doing? I just threw my net out. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. I love you too, John. Stop it. These were guys that worked hard. They probably had cut hands. They probably were very, you know, just aggressive. They're fishermen. Go look at a fisherman today. Go down to Pier 39. They're always in slickers. They got beards. They're dirty. They ain't sh shaved. They ain't showered. They're out there on the seas. They get, you know, they wake up. Their hair stuck up. They drink co coffee and they get right back to work. And they're governed by the emotions many times. These people were not like you think. 
there were some some maybe like Philip and Andrew that were more tempered and relaxed individuals. Jesus toured the whole smorgasbord. Simon the Zealot was no joke. Go do the history and come give me a book report next week. I guarantee you're going to find something that you're going to go, holy smokes. Took Matthew, the tax collector. Go see the difference that the zealots hated tax collectors. I'm talking about what a murderers hate. Like, so imagine Jesus having all these different people with him. That's why when, when, when they came to Jesus and said, we want to sit at your right hand, they started bickering. They started going, what would you do? What about us, man? You backstabbing scoundrel. That's exactly what they did. Imagine the pressure that Jesus had to deal with, the personality. Do, please do your study, please. Please don't read the Bible like, oh, wow, the 12 apostles sitting at a table, nice and friendly, like your nice little church taught you when you were a kid. It wasn't like that, friend. Sorry. Go read. Go read Acts chapter 6 when they were having strife because certain, certain groups of people weren't being fed. Amen. So Jesus right here says, I'm glad for your sakes. Why don't you pass these out, Pastor, please? That I was not there to the intent that you would believe. Nevertheless, let us go. Then Martha, verse 21, we're almost done. It's worth your time. Then Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not de be dead. I know that whatever you ask of God, see, she put it off on Jesus. How many people are putting it off on Jesus today? Jesus, if you'll do this. And you know what Jesus is saying? No, if you'll believe only, you'll see the glory. They're like, Jesus, if you'll pray, if you'll pray, pastor, if you'll pray, brother Jaime, if you'll do this. Amen. He says, but I know whatsoever you'll ask. Jesus said, look, your brother's going to rise again. Martha goes, she gives him the religious affirmation that she learned. Martha said, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection in the last day. And Jesus said, look, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though we were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives right now and believes in me will never die. He's not talking about physically. Do you believe this? Amen. I know your emotions are tired and we preach a little long. But I'll tell you this. The question is, do you believe this? I mean, Jesus is not a gamer. He is not this little soft, overly sensual, non-confronting individual that religion has made him out to be. Jesus wants to know, do you believe it? Oh, I just, you came to church, don't worry about it. Or you saw my miracles, Peter, and you were around me. So I know you're, I know you're, you know, good. <laughs> That's not Jesus. Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father and the elect angels. He didn't stop there, though. Let's stand up. He didn't stop there. Uh, Maria, I'm just going to receive the offering. Just save that for next week. We're going to make it quick. Look at Jesus didn't stop there. Look at Jesus did. He didn't just go. If you confess, do you know what Jesus said was a consequence of denying him? What was that? Wait, wait. Was that Jesus that said that? I'll deny you. See, a lot of people, they don't really know the real Jesus. It's not that Jesus is harsh. It's not that Jesus is mean. But it's that Jesus is real. Jesus is the truth. And Jesus said, if you deny me now, I will deny you then. How many of you understand? I like that. What did he do? He said, you choose what you want. He didn't say, I'm going to choose it for you. You choose, you decide what's valuable, what's important, what's worthy, what's honorable. You choose it. And you go with that all the way. Amen.
Jesus said, if you deny me, I'll deny. That doesn't sound like the Jesus you hear in society today, does it? Yet he said it all through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Jesus will not deny us when we honor him. I just, I want us to understand. Martha had many excuses. I know you're the resurrection on the last day. Uh, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And every other reasoning and excuse, and Jesus finally honed her down and said, look, I'm the resurrection and the life. Though you were dead, if you believe in me, yet you shall live. Do you believe this, Martha? And Jesus said, roll the stone back. And she goes, yeah, but by now he's thinking. If Jesus tells you, roll the stone back, say, yeah, how, how far? Not. He stinks and he's been in there four days. You get it? Jesus said, if you would believe, you then would see the glory. What he meant by believe is go ahead and act on my instructions. Go ahead and be a doer of the word, not a hearer. Go ahead and believe and let your, let your feet, your belief system have some feet, and some hands and push that stone back. Did you ever think about how, how a woman was going to get that stone back? Probably the power of God. If Jesus told her to roll the stone back, the power would have came on her like Samson. Amen. Father, we thank you for what these represent. We thank you for this Easter, Lord. I've gone on, we've gone long, but really these words, of, they penetrated the hearts of uh, the hearers, Lord. And they're working to create a reality of, of us seeing Jesus as he is. Not who we want Jesus to be, but who the gospel and who the word teaches he is. So we honor you this morning. We thank you for what these represent. It represents your life given for us. And a great exchange took place. And now, Lord, even much more, because you gave yourself for us, how much more shall the blood of Christ, much more that it cleansed us, it'll now save us, deliver us, preserve us daily. And so as we eat this, we thank you. As we partake of this, we recognize, Lord, that we were raised up with you. We were made alive because of your gift. So we thank you for the blood of Jesus that has redeemed us, cleansed us, forgiven us. We thank you this morning as we partake of this. We honor you. Just hold your hands up. We thank you. We love you, Father. We love you because you first loved us, Lord. Whom we have redemption, Lord, a continual forgiveness, day in and day out. We'll go from glory to glory and strength to strength. We honor you this morning, Lord. We bless every person here. We thank you. Now help us, Holy Spirit, to be yielded. Obey from the heart, Lord, as we go forth from this Easter. Obey from the heart, from the spirit. Under unfeigned affection. Teach us, Lord. We, we thank you. We, we cooperate with that life on the inside, with that grace, Lord, that enables us to live in a way that you called us and summons us to live by the Spirit. And so, Lord, we'll stay close to you. We'll lean in. We thank you. You're a very present help. The Lord is. Say, the Lord is my helper. I depend upon you, Lord. I look to Jesus. I thank you for your love, it's controlling, guiding, and directing me from the inside out. In Jesus' name. Father, we bless every person here today. We thank you. And as we prepare our tithes and offerings, as we give faithfully, we know that it'll be given back in us. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. You're so faithful, Lord. We thank you that every need of ours is met, and even more. This message was brought to you by Living Water Fellowship San Francisco. You can connect with us on Facebook or email us at sflivingwater.com.